How's that? Is that better? Oh, there you go. That great. Well, listen, let me just pray and then we'll get into God's word. Heavenly Father, we just say thank you again for your word. It's life, it's truth, and Lord, it's helpful for us. It reproves us, it corrects us, disciplines us, but Lord, also it instructs us in righteousness and how to live for you. So God, just teach us from your word this morning. Just bless these words to us. May we have ears to hear and a heart to receive in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, last time that uh, we were together, uh, the first week of uh, December, we looked at uh, a couple of names of God. We're looking at a series called Awe and Wonder because uh, a, a number of years ago at my previous church, we did a series just looking at who is God because we, we, we kind of talked about the idea that in society today, God is rejected for many reasons. God has been abandoned for many reasons. God is ignored at times. And, and even sometimes, even within the church, God has become way too familiar. And so what we decided to do is uh, do a bit of a study on God and who God really is. And we started off looking at the names of God. And so the last time I was here, if you remember, we looked at two different names of God. We looked at the first one being Elohim, which means God, the mighty one, just as a reminder. And we saw that in the book of Genesis, especially Genesis chapter one, didn't we? Because we noticed that it was God, it was Elohim who created the world. God, the mighty one, Elohim. And so that is one of the names of God that we just looked at briefly. The other name that we looked at, just perhaps a little bit more in detail, was the name Jehovah, taken from Exodus chapter 3, where Moses meets with God at the burning bush. And there Moses asked God, what am I to call you? And God reveals himself as Jehovah. And we looked at that, that, the root word for Jehovah is I am. And we came to see that Jehovah is the self-existent one. We also learned just from that text, didn't we, that Jehovah was God's proper personal name. It was the name that he wanted Israel to refer to him by. It was also his covenant name because he was the God who would make a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And just as he made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so too he promised to make a covenant with the children of Israel. And then, of course, we learn that Jehovah was to be exclusive to, God, uh, to Israel. It was his exclusive name. So no other nationality, no other people group were to call God Jehovah. It was personal for Israel, exclusive to Israel. So we looked at those two names last time I was here, Elohim and Jehovah. But perhaps you've done a study on the names of Jehovah because in the Old Testament, we, we um, see quite often that the noun Jehovah or name Jehovah is linked quite often with the number of adjectives and they form a compound name for Jehovah that help to describe his nature, his character, his essence. And we see some of them up on the, the screen behind me. Jehovah Jireh. We see, we know God as Jehovah Rapha, the healer. We know God as Jehovah Rohi, the God who is our shepherd. We know God as Jehovah Sitkanu, the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Makedesh, the Lord who sanctifies. Jehovah Shema, the Lord who is there. Lots of different names that we could look at. And so, so today, we're going to look at three in particular, three of those names. We don't have time to go into all of them. But here's my encouragement. If you enjoy this morning or, or if you, you feel challenged by some of these names, can I encourage you? Go and do a study of the names of God. They will really encourage you. Why should we study the names of God? Why might that be important? How would it help? Well, I've just uh, thought of a few different reasons just coming up on the, uh, the next screen here. First, just understanding the names of God help us to understand who God is. They give us insight into his nature, into his character, a bit more into his personality. They give us a greater grasp of who God really is and what he's like. They help us explain God in a way that we can relate to. Second, knowing God and his different names how it can help us in prayer and petition. 
as we address God using his self-disclosed titles, there's a sense of confidence and there's a sense of boldness as we pray, knowing that God can meet our need in that area. God is well able to do that which we are praying to him for. Third reason that it's helpful to study the different names of God is that they aid us in our worship. As we worship him, we're able to declare his praises with a greater degree of knowledge and understanding, with a specific sense of gratitude and thankfulness for the way that he acts and moves and intervenes in our lives. We're able to express in a greater way through worship who God really is and what he does. But there's one final reason, and perhaps for me, this is the most important reason of all, that studying God's names actually helps renew that reverence for his name. Moses gave the Ten Commandments to Israel, the third commandment being Exodus 27, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. In vain means to use God's names in an empty or trifling way, without appropriate reverence for him. In a similar way, Jesus teaching his disciples how to pray. How does he start that prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Reverenced be thy name. The Bible is clear. We are to respect, honor, and treat with reverence the name of God. God is not the big man upstairs. God is not the big boss in the sky. God must be revered as such. I love the way the New American commentary states it. Name refers to one's person, character, and authority. All that God stands for should be treated as holy and honored because of his utter perfection and goodness. So there's just a few reasons just to study God's name. Again, just to have that reverence, that awe, that wonder for who he is. And so today we're just going to have a look at three of those different names, three of those compound names for Jehovah, and, uh, and then wrap it up with communion. The first name I want to look at then is perhaps one that we might all be familiar with. It's Jehovah Jireh. How many of you have heard of Jehovah Jireh before? And in a number of songs, that name comes out, doesn't it? And we find the name of this account uh, in Genesis chapter 22. And in that account, in that, uh, in that story there, God is testing Abraham. If you remember the story, God asked Abraham to take his only son, Isaac, and to travel on a three-day journey to the region of Moriah, to the region of Moriah, in order that he would sacrifice his son Isaac to God there on an altar. It's a big command, isn't it? But Abraham obeys. Having arrived at the hill that God shows Abraham, Abraham then builds an altar, and he binds up his son Isaac, and places Isaac on this altar. Just as he's about to slay Isaac on that altar, Abraham hears the angel of the Lord call out, Abraham, do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. As Abraham lowered his arm, he then looked up, and in the thicket just beyond the altar, he saw a ram caught. Abraham goes and releases the ram from the thicket. And he unbinds Isaac. And in his Isaac's place, he takes that ram and puts the ram on the sacrifice. With unexplainable joy and delight in his heart, Abraham offers that uh, sacrifice to God. And he names that place Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide, for in the place of his son, God had provided this ram. The book of Hebrews tells us in chapter 11 that Isaac, in the mind of Abraham, for those three days, was as good as dead. Abraham left that morning to go on that journey to the region of Moriah, knowing that he was going to sacrifice Isaac. Isaac was as good as dead from that moment in his heart in his mind. Three days later, that intention stood, st uh, uh, still stood. 
Abraham didn't waver in his obedience. Abraham didn't um, waver in his trust of God. Rather, he trusted that Jehovah would look after his promised son, believing that God would raise him back to life. Again, we've just been singing that song, haven't we? Trust and obey. Abraham did that, even with this very hard, perhaps, command to understand. And in a very real sense, then, Abraham was, sorry, Isaac was raised, restored, and returned to Abraham. Because can you imagine the anguish of Abraham on those three days' journey? Three days of asking questions. Three days of ideas and notions flooding through his mind. Can you imagine the moments just climbing up to that final hill, ready to sacrifice Isaac? Isaac carrying the very wood for that sacrifice on his back. Abraham's asking, God, how could this be? Why should it be? What of the future now? This is my only son. Can you imagine the penultimate scene where he takes Isaac, he binds his hands, he binds his feet, and he lays him out on the altar. Perhaps his final thoughts going through his mind is, God, did I hear you properly? Would you really ask this of me? Yet still, with all those thoughts racing through his mind, he lifts the knife. And at that moment, God steps in. At that moment, Jehovah provides a substitute. Jehovah provides a ram. Isaac is spared. Isaac is saved. And a ram is sacrificed in its place. In that moment, Isaac was raised, restored, returned to Abraham. Now we know that this was a test for Abraham. And the test for Abraham was this. Who was Abraham going to honor more? Was it Jehovah or was it Isaac? Was Abraham more dedicated to honoring Jehovah or preserving his son? Abraham's experience can be our experience, can't we? Because we all face times of testing, testing in our family life, testing in our work life, testing in our social life. Sometimes God even comes and tests us too, doesn't he? To see where our love lies, where does our commitment lie, where do our loyalties lie? And like Abraham, in the midst of those testing times, we can ask questions. Why, God? Why am I going through this? Why is this situation happening to me? Why, am, why have you asked me to do this or be in this scenario? Our experience can be that of Abraham's, that at the end of our testing, God will always provide a way. He will always meet our needs. All we have to do is keep trusting, keep obeying, just as we've been singing. Jehovah Jireh will be that one who steps in and will provide in a mighty, mighty way. Why study the name of Jehovah? It helps us to know him a little bit more. Jehovah Jireh just as he provided that day for Abraham and Isaac, can provide for you and I, even in difficult testing times. The second name, or a second name then, that we come to is this, Jehovah Nissi. And we find the, this name uh, in Exodus chapter 17. The story, again, if we know it, takes place a short time after Moses has led the children of Israel out of Egypt and they're in, a, and they're in the, that desert place. They're in a place actually called Rephidim. And in this place called Rephidim, the Amalekites come to attack. The Amalekites come to take them to task. There's a battle about to take place. The day before this battle, Moses orders Joshua to get an army together to prepare them for the next day. Moses is going to climb up on a nearby mountain and he takes Aaron and Hur, two of his aides, and he goes up the mountain with these two. And the plan is to hold aloft the staff of God, the staff that Moses would uh, carry around. And he was to hold that aloft. Why did Moses hold that staff aloft? Well, the staff remained aloft. As, as the staff remained aloft, it meant that Israel would win the battle. They would be in control of the battle. But whenever that staff dropped the Amalekites started to win. And so Aaron and Hur, on that mountain, the mountainside that day, they held aloft Moses' arms. And at the end of that day, God had given Israel 
a stunning victory over an army that should have defeated them. God was fighting on their behalf. And in celebration of that battle that day, Exodus 17, 15 tells us that in that place, Moses built an altar to God. And he named that altar Jehovah Nissi, the Lord is my banner. Jehovah Nissi, the Lord is my banner. In Hebrew times, a banner was not so much a flag or an ensign made of fabric, much like we would have today. You know, when we go to war, you, we, we fly a flag or a, a symbol is, is more something that we put up a flagpole and fly. In Hebrew times, a banner was more of a decorated pole. It was a piece of wood that would be held up and decorated, and that was what stood for a banner. A banner, though, and especially in war times, had several purposes. It would serve as a rallying point for troops. People would know where to fight based on the banner. It would serve as a symbol of encouragement for so long as uh, for the troops, because as long as the troops could see that banner held aloft, they would keep fighting. There was still something worth fighting for. The banner also served as a reminder of who they were fighting for, the cause they were fighting for, the people they were fighting for. The staff of God that Moses held in his hand that day was like that banner. It was the rallying call for the Israelites to keep on fighting. It's the reminder of who they were fighting for. But the banner, the staff of God, was far, far deeper than that. The staff of God was this visible symbol of God's presence in their midst. It was a visible symbol that God was in their midst, even in that battle. It was a sign of God's sovereignty and power over the battle. So who would get the glory in the end? It wasn't Israel. It would be God. Two points of interest from the story. And the first word is, that the the location of the story, again, the location of the story is Rephidim. Rephidim in Hebrew means rest. With ironic undertones, God called Israel to their first battle in a place called rest. Even in the midst of a battle, God says, rest in me. And God defeats the Amalekites in a place called rest. When we rest in God, We can be in the midst of a battle, but know his peace and know his victory. The second thought of interest to me is this, and it's it's the way that uh, Moses concludes the story. Moses concludes the story in in verse 16 with these words. "Because Because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. If God is our banner, Those who fight against us find themselves fighting against God. Those who would lift their hands against Jehovah's chosen ones lift their hands against the throne of God. Wow, that's quite powerful, isn't it? When God is our banner, those that would oppose us are actually opposing God. So as Moses celebrates God's victory that day, he honors God, he reveres God, he celebrates God and gives him the title, Jehovah Nissi, the Lord is my banner. The final name then I want us to come to, and again, it's perhaps quite a common name and a a name we've all heard, but this one comes from Judges chapter 6, and it's Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is my peace. And this story is the story of Gideon. Again, one of the well-known characters of the Old Testament. Gideon is a man called by God to lead Israel against the Midianites. The Midianites were a nation who for the past seven years had been invading and ravaging and oppressing the people of Israel. But Gideon is a man with a few issues. Gideon is a vulnerable man. As we encounter him in Judges chapter 6, he's hiding away from the Midianites. He's hiding away in a wine press, threshing wheat. Gideon is an insecure man. When God calls him in in Judges chapter 6, what is the first thing he does? 
does. He confesses that he's from the weakest family in his clan and that he himself is the weakest and the least in the family. He's very insecure about who he is. Gideon is also a hesitant man. When God commissions him, what does he do? He asks for proof of his calling. Not just once, not twice, but three times he asks God to prove that he was going to be with him as he would lead out Israel. So he's a hesitant man. In Judges chapter 6, where we find this name for God, we find Gideon coming before God and asking for that first proof. Having received his calling, Gideon asks for a sign that Jehovah would go before him and with him into this battle. And the sign comes in a bit of a strange way. During the, the dinner that Gideon prepares for the angel of the Lord that's come to give him this message, Gideon goes away and he kills a goat and he bakes some bread and he brings it to the angel. He lays it before the angel on a rock. And instead of eating this meal that's been prepared for him, the angel of the Lord takes a staff and he touches the stew, he touches the bread. And what happens? Fire comes down, fire flares up and consumes the meal. And then the angel disappears. At that moment, Gideon recognizes that he's met with God. He's actually a bit afraid. He's seen God face to face. But God says to him, Gideon, be at peace. You will not die. So Gideon, like Moses, builds an altar. And he calls that place, he calls that altar, Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is peace. We've already described Gideon as a vulnerable, insecure, hesitant man. Have you ever felt like that at times? I'm sure we possibly all do. And yet God called Abraham, uh, sorry, God called Gideon rather, to do something that was quite amazing. He called Gideon to do something that was way out of his comfort zone. He called Gideon to do something that was far beyond perhaps his, his nature would undertake. God calls weak people to go. Interestingly, as you read the story, he, God just comes and tells Gideon, go in the strength that you have. He doesn't say, go in Peter's strength, or go in Brian's strength, or go in Nick's strength. He just says, go in the strength that you have. I will be with you. You see, those he calls, he equips, he strengthens, he supports. Therefore, they can move forward in peace. As Gideon worshipped God that day at the altar, even though he couldn't fully understand what he was about to step into and what was before him, he could step into it in peace. Jehovah was there with him. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is our peace. So there we have it. Three compound names for Jehovah. To Abraham, God was Jehovah, the Lord will provide. To Moses, God was Jehovah Nissi, the Lord my banner. To Gideon, God was Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace. I'm not sure if you picked up on it, but the reason that I wanted to bring those three names specifically is because they all had one thing in common. They all involved an altar. They all involved a point of sacrifice. After God had revealed himself in miraculous circumstances, what do these three men do? They worship at an altar in reverence, in wonder, in awe of God and what he has just done for them. And they remember Jehovah and they declare a, a new name for him. They recognize God's intervention in their lives. Today, we're going to be coming to the communion table. We come to an altar, and there we remember what God has done for us. As we do so today, as we come and remember what Jesus Christ has done, may we recognize in Jesus Christ a fulfillment, an embodiment of all those, of those three names that we just looked at today. May we see Jesus as our provider, 
You see, the account of Abraham and Isaac is a foreshadowing of what would take place 1,800 years later, 42 generations later. Because on Mount Calvary, Mount Calvary is located literally in that region of Moriah. Mount Moriah is where the, the temple was stood. Abraham took Isaac to the region of Moriah, to the very region that Jesus would later come and be hung on a cross. On that day on Mount Calvary, another son, another son was offered up to God in obedience. But he was not offered up on an altar. He was offered up on a cross. This too was an only son. Jesus was the only son. Not only was he an only son, but he was the promised son. We have to remember that Isaac was a result of a promise from God, wasn't he? Jesus came as that promised son. But hidden behind this title, Son of God, lies another title for Jesus. And that title is Lamb of God. John 1, 29, John the Baptist addressed Jesus like this. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus, as he offered up his life that day on the cross, he bore the sin and punishment for you and I. That by believing in him and his sacrifice as the appropriate atonement for our sin, we might know the forgiveness of God. We might live under the grace of God. We might grasp the mercy of God. We might experience the pardon of God. And finally, that we might be the righteousness of God. That day on Mount Calvary, God was once again Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. He provided the pardon for your sin and my sin. He provided that debt that you and I couldn't pay. He is our Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. As we come to the table, may we recognize Jesus as our Jehovah Nissi, the Lord is our banner. As Israel looked up that day in battle and they saw the staff of God, the banner of God, that symbol of God's presence in their midst, it was their, it was their reminder that God was with them, that God was fighting for them, that they, Israel, belonged to him. And it was their reminder that God was fighting for them, that those would oppose them God, they were opposing God. A good question to ask is, how do we know who we belong to? How do we know which banner we're fighting under? Isaiah 45, 22 tells us, look to me and be saved. All Israel had to do was look up and know who they were fighting for. Look, to, look unto me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. As Israel looked up that day on that battlefield, they knew God was with them. They knew salvation was coming. It's only by looking to Christ and all that he has accomplished on the cross that we are saved. He has fought the battle against sin, and he has won. All we need to do is look up. He is our banner. The author of Hebrews in chapter 12, verse 1 reminds us to keep looking at Jesus. As Pam said earlier, the day we give our lives to Christ, that's not the, the end of it. That's actually the start of it. We are to live with Christ as our banner all the way through our lives. And the author of Hebrews puts it like this. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. He is our banner. He is the one that we are to look to. He is the one that we are to labor for, follow, and battle for. And just as a nice little reminder, do you remember that place where the battle took, so the, the location where that battle took place? It was a place called Rephidim, wasn't it? That place meaning rest. As we look to Jesus, though sin and evil rage and war around us, our spirits, our hearts, our souls can be at rest. He is our Jehovah Nissi. The Lord is my banner. And finally, we come to the final one. As we come to the communion table, 
May we remember God. May we remember Jesus, rather, as our Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is our peace. As Christ dies on the cross that day, one of the majestic graces he offers to man is peace with God. Paul, writing to the Romans in chapter 5, says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. For those who look to Christ, for those who believe in his name, for those who put their trust in him, he offers peace with God. No more need for a man to fear condemnation. No more need for a man to worry about the wrath of God. Christ offers us peace with God. And then finally, one of my favorite scriptures, Isaiah 26 verse 3. He will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. When we look to God and trust in all that he has done for us in and through Christ, when we keep our minds stayed on him, fixed on him, fast on him, we can know his peace. We can know that we are right with him in every way. Jehovah is our shalom. The Lord is our peace. You know, today, we just talked about God being rejected, abandoned, ignored, way too familiar, perhaps, in some societies. My encouragement is study God's name. Get that real sense of awe and reverence and wonder for who he is. And for 2024, as we step into this new year, may it be one of those declarations that we make. God, help me to get to know you more this year. Help me to move forward in my faith this year. Help me to deepen my understanding, my knowledge of you. And as that happens, what will begin to happen is that you will fall more and more in love with him again. You will have a greater reverence for him, a greater desire to live and serve him continually through this year. Let's pray, and then I'll hand it back over to Pam. Heavenly Father, we revere you this morning. God, we ask that again we would be filled with awe and wonder of who you are. And Lord, we just covered in, in three quick accounts just the amazing ways that you've intervened in people's lives. And God, we know that you intervene in our lives too. But so often times we can miss it. Lord, I just pray that through 2024, God, that we would see you moving just as Abraham did, just as Moses did, just as Gideon did, so you would do that for us. And Lord, as we recognize you, perhaps as we grow closer to you, perhaps as we go and study these names, Lord, may we recognize that you have come to be those things in our lives, that Jesus Christ, you are the embodiment of those things in our lives. You are our banner. You are our peace. You are our provider. And we just want to come and say thank you and devote our lives continually to you. Father, again, we say thank you. We adore you. We love you. Accept our praise, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. like to stand for our next hymn, please.
that grace appeared, the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun. to sing God's praise than when we first begun. So now we're going to have our communion service. Come to this table, not because you must, but because you may. Not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come, not because any goodness of your own gives you the right to come, but because you need mercy and help. Come, because you love the Lord Jesus Christ and you'd like to know him more. Come, because he loved you and he gave himself for you. Come and meet the risen Christ, for we are his body. Pete and Godfrey, you can go up to the table, please. For I received from the Lord what I also handed unto you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Thank you. Jesus, I believe. <laughs> Jesus, I belong. Jesus said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Loving God, 
We praise and thank you for the love shown to us in Jesus Christ. We thank you for his life and ministry, announcing the good news of your kingdom and demonstrating its powers by lifting up the downtrodden, healing the sick and loving the loveless. We thank you for this sacrificial death upon the cross, for the redemption of the world and for raising him to life again. We give you thanks for this bread and wine, symbols of our world and signs of your transforming love. We pray, Lord, today that you'll send your Holy Spirit, that we may be renewed into the likeness of Jesus Christ and formed into his body. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. In the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, this is a new cup, a new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in memory of me. We give you thanks and praise, Lord God, that when, when we are still far off, you meet us, you met, meet us. Dying and living, you, you declared your love. Give us grace and open the gate of glory. May we share Christ's body, the life, risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us. So we will all your children shall be free. And the whole earth live to praise your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We'd like to stand for our last hymn. Yeah. 
Lord, for our world, where men disown and doubt you, loveless in strength and comfortless in pain, hungry and helpless, lost indeed without you. close with the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and love of God and fellowship. Amen. If we could have help, please, with setting up for mums and, oh, we don't need help with mums and tots, but if you could, we've got a big funeral on Wednesday, so if we could have help with bringing the chairs just in that back area and just making it look tidy, I'd be very grateful. Thank you. Thank you.